I have started the, the recording. Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope that you have enjoyed the previous session of the second Engage Training School. In today's session, uh, the last one, we will critically examine existing institutional indicators and discuss new metrics for better civic engagement and policy making. Sergio Tirado and I will be your host and hope uh, this session meet your expectation. As you can see here in the agenda, uh, we also have presentation by Anais Baro and Irene Gonzalez in the first stop, Roberto Barrella in the second one, and our trainee group in the last one. So this is an exciting session full of content. But now to kick off the session, I hand over to Sergio. Please, Sergio. Thank you, Raul. Um, yeah, thanks for bearing with us all the week until today. I hope we can we can do something at least as good as um, we've done in the past four days. So as Raul mentioned, in addition to our um, uh, presentations, we've also invited, with, I mean, we'll be mostly talking about uh, the case of Spain when referring to specific examples. And because of that, we've also invited um, a few of the trainees as uh, Raúl was mentioning, uh, so Irene González, Anais Baró, and Roberto Varela, uh, that will be also contributing a bit at the end of um, uh, this first uh, uh, part of the of the today's session, and also as an introduction to the Spanish National Energy Poverty Strategy. Roberto will tell us a bit what they are doing at the Chair of Energy and Poverty at Universidad Pontificia de Comillas. Um, um, because they know more about some of the stuff we will be mentioning in the uh, in our presentations. So, without further delay, I'll share my <clears throat> screen and I'll start with my presentation. Oh. Sorry, I just had an issue with PowerPoint. I'll have to reopen the presentation. It's fine. Okay, I hope you can you all can see it. Um, so the title of the presentation, my presentation is From Invisibility to Recognition, the Challenge of Hidden Energy Poverty. Um, and um, I would like to start with this, um, uh, with these two images that come from a Google search uh, using the words uh, fuel poverty. Um, and they show um, the sort of dominant imaginaries of what constitutes or has constituted for a long time our understanding of energy poverty. Um, and uh, this is partially based uh, due to the fact that um, energy poverty research and the recognition of energy poverty as a distinct policy uh, and social issue um, started in the UK um, and in Ireland, and therefore issues around um, um, uh, thermal comfort and um, energy expenditure, uh, high energy expenditure became very, very, very important. Um, and this, this still, I think, dominates our understanding of energy poverty in Europe. Also, um, as you can see, this, um, these two images um, show um, one particular um, group of vulnerable people, which are, which are, who are the elderly, and uh, I think that's also very, that's kind of a dominant part of this dominant imaginary around energy poverty. And of course, based on that, since indicators are representations of, um, of this um, reality, um, we, sorry. We, um, we have these uh, three main indicators, headline indicators, 
of the European Energy Poverty Observatory. The inability to keep home adequately warms the rears on utility bills and the high share of energy expenditure in income. Um, but, um, um, and Harry could explain much in more in detail um, uh, the, um, how things work in this, in this sense, there was the realization that especially the expenditure indicators were not capturing um, a certain form of energy poverty that consisted of people um, using um, spending very little um, uh, energy, um, what, and that that's what um, became the, the so-called hidden energy poverty indicator, which was later um, re-denominated um, uh, into low absolute energy expenditure indicator, uh, according to which households whose absolute energy expenditure is below half the national median are, are considered to be in energy poverty. And this captures and those uh, households that ration, that reduce their energy service use as a coping strategy. And I, I'm showing here a table from, from a recent article um, um, based on evidence collected in Hong Kong in which uh, five households uh, whose um, expenditure on energy was below the 10% um, that has been long used as a, uh, as a threshold to determine who is in energy poverty or not according to, to expenditures. Um, it shows that many of them engage in, in, in coping strategies based on uh, that consisted of um, reducing the, the consumption, the use of energy and water. Uh, you can see even um, uh, uh, household three that mm, mm, was reusing water, was collecting dripping water, uh, washing clothes by hand. Um, and that shows that the, this, this is one form of, um, uh, of, this is what has been uh, considered so far as uh, hidden energy poverty. What I'm bringing here today is, is a proposal to discuss other um, ways to define he, uh, hidden energy poverty. So what else can we mean by hidden energy poverty? So we may be referring to experiences or dimensions of energy poverty that are not recognized in common and or expert knowledge. Uh, for a long time, university students were not recognized as a fuel, as an energy poor social group. And then uh, recently, a couple of years ago, this paper by Saska Petrova uh, highlighted them as a vulnerable group because they're young, they're sort of they're living in this rented accommodation for just two, three years while they're at university in late teens, early 20s. So this, this is not what came to our mind when we're thinking of energy poverty. So um, that's the sort of stuff I'm, I'm talking about here. But then what happens with households on prepayment, um, on prepayment meters? Um, in some, uh, for some people, um, they, are not, they are effectively protected by the fact of having a prepayment meter, where other visions may argue um, uh, that they are being discriminated because their access to electricity or gas is not secure. And the same may happen with, with water as a dimension of energy poverty that is not sufficiently recognized. There is this mm, literature on water poverty, but perhaps we could think of, of water as, a, as an element of energy poverty in the sense that this is a resource that is needed to provide energy services. And energy poverty, as we know, is defined as in, uh, inability to access energy services, not energy as such. Um, but we could also think of hidden energy poverty um, as forms of energy poverty for which we lack data um, and indicators. So um, we know that um, we have very good data, for instance, about the price of electricity and natural gas, because that's, um, that, that's available in Eurostat, national statistics, but there is very little um, um, uh, numerical knowledge, so to say, about what's happening with solid fuels or what's happening with district heating, which are very, um, uh, very uh, of um, very common forms of heat provision um, in Central and Eastern Europe. I'm not saying here that anyone using solid fuels is by default in energy poverty, but I'm saying what I'm saying here is that we don't have the data, and also we don't have sort of the indicators. To, to, um, to detect energy poverty for these households, for households using, relying on these energy carriers. And we could also, um, in other cases, self-disconnections, informal or irregular connections. What you can see here 
um, uh, this uh, photo from, from Badalona. This is actually um, from the, the Gager Training School, the first one that we did in Barcelona a couple of years ago in 2019. You see that, bit, that building burn because a very complex uh, uh, housing precarity situation that led to irregular connections and effectively um, two or three people dying, if I remember correctly. And again, this is not being um, captured in available indicators in situations such as this. And then um, uh, we may also think of hidden energy poverty from the perspective of actors that have that they're in charge of uh, providing support or in charge of alleviating um, um, this form of deprivation. Um, so um, for municipal social services, and we've seen that in the energy advisor help desks, which are, in, which are very advanced sort of um, 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 uh, support service uh, for vulnerable, any vulnerable people in Barcelona, that they are not, because it's a self-referral so, sort of service, so people need to go to those offices um, to, to, um, to, to ask for support, um, they, they are not being able to, to um, reach out to, to all um, households, all household typologies that, that, um, that may be in energy poverty. But then you also have the case of unregistered tra transient populations such as migrant seasonal laborers. And what, on the right hand side, you can see the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights was visiting um, a, a campsite, a very, I mean, these are huts uh, inhabited temporarily by, uh, by migrant workers in agricultural fields in Southern Spain. They go there for um, a few weeks to, to um, they, they are hired to, to pick strawberries and they are living in, in, in abject poverty, would you could say, no access whatsoever to proper access to, to, to water and electricity. And this is a reality that's, uh, in, that is again um, uh, hidden and then goes um, uh, very much unrecognized by, by, of course, it's a very specific sort of reality, but that goes unrecognized um, by current indicators. So um, building what uh, Kate Robinson presented, this is uh, hidden energy poverty and the, all the issues that go with that are a matter of recognition justice in the sense that all those experiences, forms of energy poverty that are not uh, present in current measuring frameworks, monitoring frameworks and metrics, they, they go unrecognized or, um, or, even, or misrecognized. But of course, that has um, implications in terms of distributive justice in the sense that this uh, creates um, these uh, results in lack of redistributive action. In Spain, we've, we have some support by, um, on for, uh, energy price support through social tariffs, uh, but there is uh, very little about um, irregular or insecure connection to the access to the, to, 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 the, to the energy supply. And this may deepen inequality. Of course, there are also implications in terms of procedural justice, because those people who are not, um, who are experiencing forms of energy poverty that are not recognized through indicators, they are also excluded from participation. And um, a, an ex a very recent and um, blatant example of what I'm talking about is the case of Cañada Real, which is this 16 kilometer linear informal settlement um, east of the city of Madrid. Um, this is again, a very complex uh, informal regular housing uh, situation that uh, started in the 1960s. For a long time, they've been living there. They didn't have, um, 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 the, the, the housing uh, situation uh, was not um, properly recognized, legally recognized. But what happened in October last year is that um, for reasons that are not easy to explain or into, to, are, are not very well known, a whole section of this whole informal settlement went dark. Uh, they switch them off. They don't have a uh, secure access to electricity anymore. So what you can see here is the city of Madrid in the background, well lit. And this is um, um, a performance organized by an urban art collective called Boa Mistura. Uh, they, they, they got people from Cañada Real, from this settlement, um, and they um, wrote with candles, nos están apagando, they are switching us off. 
in order to denounce um, the the fact that um, some several thousand people, including more than one thousand children, are living without electricity um, uh, since October uh, last year, and that uh, that again um, is poorly. It's very it's very difficult that the the current indicators that are available at the national and, and EU level uh, capture this sort of reality. So what's, um, what can be a way to um, um, incorporate experiences, forms of energy poverty that go unrecognized? One way could be through the lived experience sort of approach that is being very much pushed forward by, by our colleague Lucy Middlemiss. Um, and uh, there is this um, very nice paper from, the, from 2015, Fuel Poverty from the Bottom Up, and that I think is the first one that comes up with this idea of, of looking at the research in uh, energy poverty from lived experience using this emic perspective. This is coming from, um, from the anthropology literature. So taking into consideration, um, listening to what people who are in conditions in a situation of energy poverty tell you what energy poverty is about, in contrast to, to the ethic perspective um, uh, in which researchers and an outsider observer um, uh, defines what energy poverty is. And effectively, this limited experience approach is being used, um, in, in, for instance, in Scotland. The Scottish government commissioned a lived experience um, um, research um, um, very recently, and they're using that to, for informing their policies. And as a suggestion, perhaps this lived experience approach could be um, the ground for a new um, hidden energy poverty indicator that spoke about lack of access, indebtedness, insecure access to the supply, and issues um, uh, such as those. So um, in a way of a conclusion, some final remarks. First, um, something that we said in this paper that we co-authored with Seen, Harriet, and a few others from the Engaged Network, the map is the, not the territory, the menu is not the middle. Indicators are schematic numerical representation of the complex realities of energy poverty. And in, in a way, they, they shape and even um, construct our understanding of energy poverty. And therefore, they, it may bias or obscure certain aspects of, of that. Um, the, the fact, uh, I mean, we've talked, um, uh, what I've presented um, wasn't looking at the sub-household scale, but then we may think that um, gender and age mediate the experience of energy poverty within the households and also issues around the unequal burden sharing. So um, there is, of course, not everyone in the household is, has the same experience of energy poverty. For instance, women are more often in charge of energy service, ser intensive services. And whether even if children are recognized as a very vulnerable population from the point of view of energy poverty, their views and concerns are virtually un unknown. Perhaps Idene will tell us a bit more about that. Um, then should we talk about unrecognized experiences or populations? Well, I, my concern is that um, uh, visibilizing certain aspects of energy poverty um, that can be very controversial for the general public, such as irregular connections or informal housing, we risk re-stigmatizing marginalized social groups, such as the Roman Central Eastern Europe, that are being very, well, there is this idea they basically they steal firewood, or people in irregular housing that they, are, they just don't want to pay their, their energy bills. And there, they, there are discourses in, in our societies that stigmatize uh, these groups. So um, uh, re by recognizing the, their energy poverty experience, we may risk uh, re-stigmatizing uh, this, uh, this population. And finally, perhaps we can think of more democratic energy poverty monitoring approaches, um, more participatory uh, processes in which energy poverty, new energy poverty indicators um, are, um, the, are, um, are co-constructed by the very people that are subject to, to energy poverty. Um, and, um, and perhaps the lived experience approach can, can help us um, design indicators from the bottom up. Yeah, thank you. I hope I didn't use too much time. Hmm. I would pass it on to you, Raul.
Thank you, Sergio. Uh, after this uh, presentation, uh, I will try to uh, provide more practical uh, topic showing different cases in Spain uh, and how this is uh, we can recognize you know, the situation in, in Spain uh, through different uh, cases. So in Spain, as you will know, we have the national uh, strategy against energy poverty. Uh, was uh, launched by the government in 2019. But uh, however, we have uh, found that uh, this indicator overclue and exclude uh, from the analysis most vulnerable group such as uh, people living in informal housing and with uh, irregular connection, houseless person, people of ethnic minority background, or disabled people. Uh, this is a, 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 a issue of current energy strategy that should be addressed. So here I, I bring four different cases uh, in Spain. The first one is a hidden uh, deprived uh, neighborhood in the city center of Getafe, where current housing stock is of poor uh, quality and doesn't mean adequate energy efficiency standards. This leads a household uh, to be called a home and even children uh, uh, to be unable of uh, studying uh, at home. Again, uh, the second one is the, 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 the one has presented Sergio, uh, is La Caña Real. This is a settlement isolated from the city of, of Madrid, neglected by regional government for more than uh, 25 years. And the other, uh, in, in the right side, we can see uh, the cases of Catalonia and Granada, uh, two neighborhoods located in the city outskirts uh, where low-income people live in dwelling uh, with very poor quality and a lack of minimum energy infrastructure, leading to continual backouts. Uh, and overall, all of them, you know, the four uh, cases, have the same socialism, the lack of basic energy services. Well, here I would like to show um, that uh, we have found uh, common contextual uh, particularities. In the first one, we found discriminatory uh, practices from energy companies. Then uh, there is a uh, energy injustice because this case needs uh, of a specific uh, solution. We can't define uh, the same solution for all of them as uh, the, the current energy strategy does. The second one is the intersectionality aspect in which uh, energy deprivation is a combination of different social inequality dimensions. So it's a complex uh, issue uh, to, to address. And the last one is uh, that we find a lack of uh, public responses because current energy pol policy don't, uh, don't uh, consider and exclude no, uh, the broad spectrum of the, of the phenomenon. But well, uh, what are the, the main impact? No? With this uh, uh, picture no? and the different uh, evidence, no? I would like to show no, uh, one of the main impact, no, these uh, people, no, uh, has been struggling, no, in, in the last month. So we can see that uh, they are living long periods without electricity, and in some cases, as uh, Sergio has mentioned before, over three months in some uh, social La Cañada Real. Even though there are continual riots uh, complaining about the situation. So there is a difficult situation with over uh, 1,800 children uh, don't have uh, covered their basic needs, meaning they can study at home, uh, have a warm bath and food. Uh, they are uh, unable to stay in work in winter. So this is a quite difficult situation uh, that even uh, leads uh, to the stigmatization of the population at different levels from children to others. Well, uh, that is a, a solution. What uh, we can do? 
the thing is that there is no a, a one-way solution. There is as many solutions as uh, different cases we can find. But here we can think about, about uh, several of them, such as engaged household in making a more efficient use of energy in some cases, enhanced population awareness and engagement about uh, energy poverty consequences, guarantee a, a safe uh, electric grid, develop case-oriented technical and social solution because uh, uh, as we can see, you know, these cases have a, a specific uh, issue, so we need to focus on, on them. And uh, identify and understand vulnerable group uh, situation. This is uh, quite important. And then uh, I would like uh, to show you this uh, uh, quite nice video uh, that we made for the Engage Energy Rights Forum. This uh, exemplify you know, the situation, so I would like uh, all of you to watch it. Yeah, I don't think it's working, Raul. So Rodrigo no. is saying that no. Um, but do, do you do do you hear the 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 video? Um, no, no, we cannot hear it. So uh, Rodrigo is saying here we we need to select share audio while clicking in share. Yeah, he, he would be needing to stop sharing and then clicking again and click on share audio. Share sound actually, bottom, bottom left. Todo el día, completamente no. todo no. el día, se o tres sin suministro. Mi pareja fue para que corriera al aire porque esto era. Esto era agobiante. Fui al baño y abrió una ventana que tenemos en el baño que es pegable y nada falló, se le cayó encima, perdió el conocimiento durante 15 minutos, tuvimos que ir a urgencia, en fin, los problemas que no va en el en invierno, pues muchísimo frío, mis piernas necesitan calor porque si no me duelen muchísimo, en plena ola de frío nos cortan en la luz tres o cuatro días seguidos, Aparte que a diario, a diario son cinco o seis cortes al día, 
y apenas tenemos suministro tres o cuatro, cinco horas o dos horas, depende. Y nada, que mi silla a, apenas puedo cargarla. Cuando es un día o dos días sin suministro, la silla eléctrica no la podemos, no la podemos cargar, ni puedo salir a hacer compras o hacer alguna gestión, o por pues, si ocurre algo urgente, tampoco podría salir de la casa. Es decir, que esto es una situación muy, 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 muy agobiante porque es a diario. Lo estamos sufriendo. Eh, hay gente que estamos pagando la luz, estamos llamando. Nos dicen que los técnicos están en la zona arreglando, se tiran 8 o 9 horas y, y no, no vienen cuando quieren ni ponen el fusible. Es decir, los que es una situación muy, 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 muy incómoda, muy insoportable, antihumano, porque te sientes impotente, te sientes eh, como manipular, como un régimen que nos están manipulando, no tienes derecho, una cosa es básica que es para vivir y eso no lo están negando. Eh, es deciros que, que es una situación muy, muy incómoda. Eh, y incluso hasta pensar salud, nuestra salud se está agravando porque ya te pones de mal humor, te sientes impotente, todos los días son iguales, no puedes poner lavadora, no puedes hacer de comer, te pasas los días aquí en confinamiento en cuatro paredes sentado a oscura, eh, echando mano a recursos que no teníamos antes, como una estufa de butano, gastar en comprar botellas o comprar lámparas o velas. Muy pésimo, muy pésimo porque nuestra salud se está notando, eh, pasamos frío y cuando hace calor, pues muchísima calor, muchísima calor. Nada, que al que le corresponda esto, que por favor queremos ponerle un voz a nuestro problema y que nos escuche. Ok, that's all. Uh, sorry for the technical issues. Uh, now, um, I would like to uh, to uh, invite uh, Anais, Anais Baru to his, uh, uh, her insight about uh, uh, this situation or this topic, because she has been uh, working on this uh, issue uh, in her PhD. So, uh, please, Anais. Hi, Raúl. Um, thank you very much. I think that uh, I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK. I don't know if you have the permissions. Mm. Let me... I'll make you co-host, Anais. OK. And also Irene as well. Okay, so now um, share screen. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks Sergio and Raul for organizing this last session of the training school and also for inviting us to contribute to it. Um, in this very short contribution, I just want to introduce uh, two examples of uh, hidden energy precarity situations. These examples are drawn from the research and field work I have done for my PhD dissertation, which is still in progress, uh, but also from activism experiences. Uh, so in this presentation, I, I want to highlight two types of hidden energy precarity situations uh, through examples from the Spanish context. These uh, refer on the one hand to energy poor populations uh, excluded from energy poverty policies, both because they are non-targeted populations 
by EP policies or also because uh, they are difficult to reach communities in terms of policy measures in general. Um, I want also to mention energy precarious phenomenon that are not covered uh, by energy poverty official definitions. And therefore they are not even included in the diagnosis of energy poverty in Spain. And subsequently they are not covered by any policy in place. Uh, first, regarding the non-targeted uh, targeted populations, I would like to highlight uh, the ethnicity dimension uh, as something that uh, it's not usually considered in EP policies. I have had the opportunity to explore uh, energy poverty impact in Roma people communities, and it has led me to some challenges that uh, I want to share. The first one is, um, is the need to question uh, to how extent these populations, and in particular, as an example, uh, the Roma people, Roma people are underrepresented in current metrics. The second one is connected uh, to the intersectionality theories uh, or using an intersectionality lens uh, in energy poverty metrics. And this challenge uh, connects with um, the question how we can incorporate intersectionality lens in, in energy poverty metrics, meaning how we can include inequality access in metrics, not only as additive layers to energy poverty and as, as layers of inequality, but as uh, mutually constitutive, uh, constitutive elements. A second example uh, connected, connected also to the first one are energy precarity situations, usually geographically located in certain neighborhoods with similar urban characteristics that having the same consequences and effects as energy poverty are not considered as it. For example, I am referring to energy precarity situations such as uh, systematic electricity disconnections for entire neighborhoods that can last hours and days, uh, like the example that we just saw um, of Mary Path, that she was, um, well, she is a neighbor from uh, the north area of Granada. And uh, this type of situations, energy precarity situations, the characteristic they have is that they are more related to infrastructural aspects, uh, such as quality and continuity of supply, uh, rather than drivers as income or economic drivers or energy efficiency of the, the building stock. So for example, um, well, later I think that Roberto will uh, talk a little bit more about the, the energy poverty national strategy, but with the new strategy, um, we introduced new definitions for, well, new, no, the first ones <laughs> official definitions of energy poverty and vulnerable consumers. But uh, this type uh, of energy precarity situations are not even, um, I don't know, uh, they, they, don't, they do not have the possibility to be included in the spectrum of energy poverty phenomena that the national strategy, um, well, uh, contemplates, no? So, well, these are only two examples, but uh, I'm sure that now Irene will um, develop, I don't know, like uh, she is trying to explain about other types of heat energy precarity situations. And of course, if you want to know more about them or you want to know more about my research, um, I mean, I'm open to questions and or any debate. Thank you very much. Hi, thank, thank you, Anais. Um, Sergio, do you think that I can share my screen? Yeah, I hope you can. Uh, yeah, it's, it's can okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to put it into. Then it's better. Yeah, because if not, yes. it doesn't recognize the English. I don't know why. Well, then uh, I, I'm. I'm this uh, particular slide, uh, I will make it as a member of the Alliance Against Energy Poverty. I'm a member of the Alliance since like uh, more or less um, five years. And, and we think it's very, what we have seen uh, is that there's like other experiences of energy poverty that might not be captured by official indicators or might not be measured yet or might not be taken into consideration according to what we have shared these days and um, I realize this is a maybe a particular case in Spain and other countries and there's other countries that don't have this reality 
So that's why it's also important like to low down into this um, national, regional and local level. Um, in the, the um, I don't know how Sergio called it, the, the assessment, energy poverty assessment points in Barcelona. The energy you... advisory help desks. Yes, the energy advisory help desks. Uh, they um, launched their like last statistics this week saying that uh, they had like 40% uh, more of people uh, um, than last year due to the COVID situation. And that 41% uh, of households in debt reported like having been harassed about their electricity debt and 20% in gas and 36% about water. And in, in, in the Alliance, we share like the different situations of families affected. And there's a very common situation people saying that they are being like called uh, uh, first thing in the morning, last thing before they go to bed, they receive calls from different numbers, even though if they try to like um, erase the number, they, they get called from another one. Like um, in terms of the debt, sometimes it's like 200 euros, sometimes it's more. And, and we got to the situation that one of the women that came to the Alliance, she got like these, those debts in Spain are, are um, currently so, uh, sold to enterprises that uh, try to recover the debt from people. And that uh, in one particular case, the enterprise calling and that's explained here in the general information, um, the, the person identified herself as an official of the judiciary. And that's, um, that's not legal. So we are now uh, taking this uh, particular enterprise to court and um, for this harassment, this illegal harassment. What we mean to say is that sometimes for those people being harassed for their debt, um, the major impacts are due to the harassment and not due to the, let's say, cold temperatures or for the debt itself, but for the fact of being like prosecuted uh, every day uh, because of the debt. And that's for, uh, that's like for us a major point that it's not currently captured for the mainstream like energy poverty uh, discourses. And then another thing, and then that's my work as an academic, I would say. Uh, I'm, I'm currently doing a PhD on trying to capture like uh, children's insight, uh, their energy poverty situation, because I mean, there's like literature that there's enough literature that uh, reports um, specific impacts on children. Uh, it, 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 there's even like articles from Kimberly O'Sullivan from uh, like a children, a survey made by children and for like, let's say teenagers and for teenagers uh, in their experience of energy poverty. And I completely love Caitlin's um, presentation on, I thought that was on Tuesday because like here we are working from an energy justice perspective, not distribution procedure and recognition in terms of children, they completely misrepresented and underrepresented in the energy poverty discourses, but those that they are suffering it in a different way, we suspect. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to do is like to develop this better understanding of children's lived experience and what, um, what how energy uh, poverty impacts on them and, and, and from this perspective of, of children as, as agents and as experts in their lived experience, because most of the times when we consider children, we consider this like uh, as, as a policy object, but not as policy makers. And we also consider them as little adults or adults in process, not these uh, adults becoming, but children are beings and they have like their own feelings and perspective. And in this uh, particular example, there's also uh, the case that we have been all of us reporting of La Cañada Real because uh, in La Cañada Real, children uh, like the, the, those drawings to the United Nations and they wrote letters to the United Nations saying like we are being tortured because we, we have been without light in this cold for like a lot of, of, of months yet. That was on, on the Filomena storm. And there was like really, really cold temperatures in Madrid because they had like snow for, 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 for several days. So um, it, it's like very important to try to capture the, this uh, lived experience of underrepresented groups so that we can build like a better understanding of energy poverty impacts. And I will stop sharing, okay. 
And I think uh, it's Roberto, uh, the next uh, one. No, no, we'll, uh, thank you, Irene, Anna, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. You know, it's just that uh, let's, um, I mean, I'm sorry we've, oh, it's a quarter to 11. Um, my fault here, I took too much time with my presentation. Um, is it okay if we take like seven, 10 minutes to discuss a bit what, uh, what we've presented? Any questions, mm -hmm. comments, reactions, also examples from your own mm -hmm. context um, about uh, our presentations? Please, Pedro. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the very interesting presentations. Um, I have a question. Just yesterday, I was reading the Portuguese um, national strategy for energy poverty, and it does not consider uh, hidden energy poverty, not uh, hidden energy poverty, not even in the in the um, most conventional uh, concept of of low abnormally low energy consumption. Um, so I, I was wondering if uh, if this specific cases of hidden, hidden energy poverty that, that Sergio and, and also the other presenters were, were, were mentioning should be considered at the national uh, level policies or should be addressed perhaps more at uh, local um, or regional policies. And also um, policies are very reliant on, on quantitative, quantitative data. Um, and for these specific cases where data is not available, um, do you think it's viable to have policy solely or mostly based on on qualitative approaches and qualitative uh, data? Do you think there's a this should be done or there's a, a way to do this? Thank you. Um, yeah, those are very good points. Um, first of all, because many of these situations or some of these situations affect a, a small part of the population, so people living in regular housing. Or people living um, with a, in, an insecure connection to the, to the energy supply, there is what we may call the tyranny of statistics. If if it's just 0.5 percent of the of the country's population, it is easy to overlook those because it affects a very narrow percentage. But the, but that's not the case for all the cases we we're talking about. I mean, um, Irene was talking about children in energy poverty, and mm, I mean, many of the households that are in some way in some um, um, in energy poverty in some way, uh, in a country like Spain, um, will, will be having their own views, experiences, and concerns um, that, uh, and that, that amounts to several million children, probably, in, again, in a country as Spain. Another issue is how do you capture this, and if it is possible at all to capture all, the, all those uh, experiences or forms of energy poverty through indicators. And I think that's a very valid point. And um, I mean, the lived experience approach that Lucy Middleman, Middleman puts, puts forward relies very much on quantitative, qualitative storytelling, energy poverty vignettes that really are very good complement to the cold numbers that you, you get from indicators. Harriet and Min. Yeah, I think it's really challenging when you try to bring in qualitative and, and sort of integrate that within quantitative indicators. So it's something we've been working on for a couple of years now in various little pilots. And I think the thing that I like from it is that it presents a much wider view on energy poverty, but in a way that I think is unpalatable to policymakers. Um, so the thing that keeps coming up is that it, it you know, there's often a very basic... There's always a race to the bottom, I find, with energy poverty to bring it down to what's the minimum that people need. You know, they just need to cook and to uh, have their thermal comfort met. And it, I think bringing in qualitative perspectives on how people use their energy in an everyday sense or, or what they would aspire to really helps to kind of widen it out and understand, uh, you know, it's important for education, for for leisure, for well-being, all sorts of things. But but in a way that people, to take an example from, from our Mexican case study, um, everyone will talk about the importance of um, uh, what do you call it, a food blender, uh, because otherwise they would have to do it all by hand. And then people will be like, well, that's not really that important. They could do it by hand. And it's like, well, but it would take them hours and hours. 
you know, everyone, nearly most households, like 80% of the population owns one. So it, it does create a lot of challenges that we have to be willing and policymakers have to be willing to see things in a much wider um, sense beyond just getting by and surviving. Thanks, Harriet. Um, Min, would you like to? Yeah, um, I agree. And I, I would like to emphasize the leave experience approach uh, is very much uh, focused on the local based context. So um, I think um, I, if I might think about an example of energy poverty, hidden energy poverty that I've been experienced, I think it would be uh, living on a boat in a canal, which is uh, a settlement. Uh, a living settlement that many people might um, don't have home and they only live on the boat. Um, and those are totally disconnected from the energy grid and all of the energy is, is uh, ordered either from fossil fuel or um, renewable energy by solar panel, but obviously not enough to sustain through winter, for example, um, in very cold uh, country. And I think those countries like Amsterdam, um, uh, those cities like Amsterdam will have a lot of population that live on the boat. I'm not sure that it will be covered by the policy um, uh, for, for uh, measuring energy poverty in those settlements. Yeah. yeah, thanks, uh, Min, Min, Rodrigo, and then Irene, I wanted to share. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for the presentations. Uh, building up on Pedro's comment about data um, lack of uh, availability or the lack of data available regarding those mi minorities and also the, the response, uh, Sager's re response and, um, and means as well comments. Do you guys think that uh, the actual off-grid status could be used as a metric uh, for assessing uh, energy poverty and uh, in a way include the, that minority group or groups. I, um, I would say that it, it, it will probably depend on the context. Um, I mean, definitely someone living off grid in Cañada Real, which is 10 kilometers from Madrid um, is, a, very clear case of energy poverty related to lack of access. Um, um, perhaps in, in other context, I'm thinking uh, mm, um, rural areas of developing countries, perhaps they, um, mm, 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 the, the, the meaning is slightly different, even though I think international organizations systematically refer, I mean, refer to those conditions as being in energy poverty as lack of access as well. Okay, can we have Irene and Luca and, and we'll yeah. close it there. Yeah. I will be like very short. Just to, to something that Harriet said. Um, I think that in, in terms of policymakers to capture the lived experience, it's very interesting because sometimes uh, indicators will induce politics that are not really 100% effective in terms of improving people's situation. But for example, in, 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 the, in the case of the harassment, like uh, we had like this social bonus in Spain, people kept on saying that the problem was the debt and that was not solved, it's still not solved. But still in, in, in what we, what lived experience people said is that the, uh, like a legal framework was needed to be developed to forbid like uh, harassment practices, for example, and that's an energy poverty policy. And that has not been developed. Um, that that has been developed now in in Catalonia, for example, because of people saying, like, to the ombudsman all the time that that was the problem because they were being harassed, and that's the first thing they wanted to solve. So I think that um, no, no, no. I, I I know I know that you you didn't mean that, but I but I I think that uh, that public policy needs like those lived experience to try to capture like more impact more real impact in everyday life because indicators sometimes hide like 
uh, most of the energy exclusion cases. I, I, I know that you didn't mean that at all, but I think that that's, that's, those are interesting cases on how those lived experience like managed to put forward like best energy public policies, I think. Okay, uh, Luca. Uh, no, thank you for the question and for the question. Um, uh, <clears throat> before, I think Sergio was saying that uh, as Pedro was discussing the difference between a small amount of population that uh, has some uh, issue in related to energy and someone that, like in Spain, are more uh, wide. So there was some sort of uh, differences between something that is easily addressed because the few people are uh, suffering from the type of energy poverty, while uh, more wider, wider strata of population that are uh, suffering from this type of uh, energy poverty. So the, the extra question to Sergio that uh, was mentioned, it, how you define how something is uh, uh, related to the 0 0.5 so it can be addressed uh, by targeting policies and how you define something that is uh, a consequence of energy poverty that are uh, affected from the minority, but is not a minority in the sense that it's 0 0.5. So this is, I don't know if I, it's clear the question, but uh, so we use the word minority because it's not the norm. That is why we use minority. And also we use minority because it's actually a, a small amount of population that suffer from it. So I think there needs to be a normative uh, uh, framework to define when we mean minority in the sense of no, and why you mean when you mean that it's a minority in the sense of numbers, and how you do that. Is it clear the question? Oh. I, I, the connection broke a bit. So when the, the question is whether a minority is when it's a small number or? Or uh, not the norm, because you were saying mm -hmm. before something mm -hmm. very, very clear that, okay, this uh, type of uh, energy poverty is from the 0 0.5 population. So once you define, it's actually easy to target because it's small number and also small resources to them. In other case, minority mm -hmm. is the sense it's not the norm. Yeah, I think we are talking about both. I mean, this is kind of thinking. Yeah, we're talking as about talk. both, but we need a normative framework also to divide resources. Yeah, I mean, main response. My res quick response to that uh, it would be that there is a bit of a tension uh, between like indicators have been instrumental in recognizing energy poverty at the EU level and, at, and also at. At the national level, I mean, we've seen we've seen that in Spain that like the recognition and the proposal of new uh, of specific energy poverty policies have come hand in hand with the development and in, of indicators. And actually, the national energy poverty strategy adopted the four indicators from the from the European Observatory, and then and that's the basis of the strategy. So they are absolutely um, crucial for to to understand where we are at right now. But then the, the issue is that they they uh, they miss many other other forms of energy poverty that are not represented by the indicators, and uh, and I think that it's uh, it's it, it's um, we are at a time in which this needs to be discussed. That would be sort of my conclusion. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we'll, yeah, shall we, we stop it yeah, here. And... Yeah, we can have uh, five minutes and. Come back, not to start with the practice. Thank you. So eleven five. Yeah, eleven five. Very short break. Okay, I am recording. Um, we are going to continue, and um, as the the practice is going to be based on the national uh, uh, strategy against energy poverty, uh, uh, Roberto, uh, who has been working no, on how uh, we can improve no, and, and address those flaws uh, in the current strategy. Uh, he's going to explain the, the, what the strategy is and different no, uh, um, line of research they have been working on to, to address that. No? 
Uh, also, I have uh, sharing the a summary of the energy uh, strategy, you know, the energy poverty strategy in Spain that uh, you can find in the Epipedia project. It's an engaged uh, initiative. So, uh, in the link you can you can find, it and we will work uh, with that uh, after uh, Roberto's presentation. Please, Roberto. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Raúl, for the for the presentation. So today we will talk about the, the Spanish national strategy against energy poverty. And on one end, we will say the policy framework of the strategy, so all the measures that have been proposed. And on the other hand, we will focus on the more research perspective. So we will see the role of academia implementing and improving the, the strategy. But for the for the first part, the, um, the main introduction of the of the strategy was the introduction, introduction of an official definition of energy poverty. They define energy poverty as the situation in which a household cannot meet its domestic energy needs as a result of insufficient income, and which in some cases may be aggravated by energy inefficient housing. And on the, on the basis of that, also they proposed to um, to improve our knowledge about the energy expenditure of Spanish households to better understand energy poverty. Regarding more the quantification and measurement of the problem, they are the, the strategy is based on the four primary indicators of HIPOV, in particular the high share of energy expenditure income to him, who presents the proportion of households whose share of energy expenditure in income is more than twice the national major share. And the opposite, opposite view of the low absolute energy expenditure, M over two, who present the share of households who sh whose absolute energy expenditure is below half the national media. So it is a kind of underconsumption indicator more than energy poverty. We will see that uh, uh, in the presentation. The inability to keep up adequately warm, that is a subjective indicator because the people in interviewed uh, answer to the question, can you or a household afford to keep its home adequately warm? And then the last one, and is based on arrears or on utility bills. So looking at the, the analysis of the indicators that the strategies made between 2015 and 2029, we can see that there is no clear pattern in these indicators. And sometimes we cannot really state why they are changing uh, among the years because they are relative thresholds indicator. So they are affected by energy prices, by income, by, or by a um, financial crisis um, that we, we will see in 2020 what was happened with these indicators. And, and based on that, anyway, the, the government set up some reduction targets for energy poverty and particular uh, for 20, 2025. There is a minimum target of reducing energy poverty by 25% and a desired target of 50%. And how to do that? They introduce uh, a broad approach and a, a comprehensive approach of public action and policies. In particular, we can see that there are two kind of main, main kind of policies: the mitigating measures policies, and in these uh, kind of policies, so short-term policies, they introduce some financial intervention. In particular, they analyze the shortcomings of the current social tariffs. And on the other hand, they propose a unique aid for all energy uses that is similar to the, for example, the energy voucher in, in France. And also they propose more protection for, for consumers, in particular the vulnerable ones. And on the other hand, they set up um, um, proposals for structural measures and to raise uh, the awareness on energy poverty, but also to provide more information so the people can actually get out of energy poverty because they know what, why they're spending too much or um, um, what is the structure of the, of the energy bill. And on the other hand, 
another important uh, axis of the of the strategies is energy efficiency and they propose in this sense short medium and long term structural measures such for example energy retrofitting and to the at the end of the strategy they propose a governance of the strategy and the implementation period is between 2019 and 2024 and they set up and proposed the participation of multi-level uh, administration, as well as other stakeholders and social groups affected by energy poverty. And so regarding monitoring, they proposed to monitorize the implementation of strategy across the, these five years, but also having a final evaluation of the strategy. And currently the government, in particular the ministry, is working on the first action plan to implement the national strategy. But the question is what we can do from the academia to implement and improve also the strategy. So we point out five, five bullet points that is research work that can be done to, to help policymakers. The first one is the analysis of domestic energy expenditures for Spanish households. The second one is more based on indicators that will be based more on absolute threshold instead of relative ones. And then the other three points that is the analysis of the shortcomings of the current social tariffs and also propose alternative ways to improve that, or for example, propose a minimal uh, living supply. And then also it's important to assess the impact of these retrofitting measures on, on energy poverty. And the last one is um, actually I'm from the chair of energy and poverty, and we are trying to to fulfill two objectives. On one end, an interdisciplinary research, including different areas, and on the other hand, we are trying to serve as a meeting point for all the stakeholders. So, so we include energy companies, uh, NGOs, association, and we are trying to include also the people affected by by energy poverty. And the first two points, we, we were been working a lot on the first two points, especially on domestic energy needs. We define uh, a concept of required energy expenditure that is uh, present, and this is actually in the, in the strategy, that is the required uh, expenditure for households to fulfill, to attain to their necessitated uh, energy needs. And we, we divided this in two main needs. On, on, on the left, we can see the, the firm energy expenditure that are more geographical and climatic uh, dependent, um, and they are heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. And on the other hand, on the, on the right side, we can see the required electricity expenditure that are more related to appliances, uh, to lighting and it depends also um, on the composition of households and the occupation of the of the dwelling and other parameters. And on basis of that, we tried to propose, um, for example, for the low absolute energy expenditure indicators, a um, different approach. So to introduce um, a threshold, an absolute threshold for each household. So we have to analyze each household and see what the, what is the, the what are the household needs, and based on on the characteristics of the household, not based on relative thresholds that depends on the national median or or something that like that. And we can see from the graphic that it's very different if we actually measure the household needs or we compare it with the national median. For example, in 2019. Uh, according to an absolute, an absolute threshold indicator, uh, we use the required energy expenditure. The half of the population were under consuming, but now the, the challenge is how can we include more income criteria to actually eliminate all the false positives of this indicator. So all the people, for example, who are consuming really for energy efficiency or for cautiousness or for because for other reasons. So what if we can identify hidden energy poverty, fixing, for example, an income criteria. And on the other hand, how we can include the invisible energy poverty. So the people are not in statistics. And we are trying to do that with a, a Spanish NGO who actually uh, visit um, for now 8,000 households 
all around Spain and um, doing like a more direct survey, we can actually know what is the situation of these households. So these are the reference that we use for, the, for this presentation. And I will thank you very much for, for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm here for, for answering. Uh, thank you, Roberto. I think that uh, Harriet has a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Um, well, I was, I was curious about how you calculated the required energy expenditure on the one hand, because I, I didn't think that Spain had a kind of comprehensive housing stock model like we do in the UK. And then on the other hand, um, I don't know, I always think there's a risk if you use a fixed threshold that it won't get updated and then you end up with a UK situation of a really arbitrary 10% definition. Um, so I think, how do you build in um, mechanisms to make sure that it's reviewed regularly? Um, so you're not just kind of locking people into patterns, you know, 20, 30 years ago, as, as is the case that we had in the UK. Okay. So regarding more the, the, the modeling of the of the energy expenditure, we we try to um, to include in that um, most of the main parameters, at least the main parameters of households. So we are trying to include the household composition, the efficiency of the dwelling. So every household um, of the, whatever survey you're using, we know we have some characteristics and some patterns. And we are not. We cannot uh, compare uh, large family households with a with a single person. So we're trying to introduce all this characterization on one end to characterize how much they had to spend to keep the, the home comfortably warm and also comfortably uh, cool during during summer. And on the other hand, we're introducing like um. Um, a more comprehensive way because energy poverty has been uh, based especially on the people not able to keep home and they were getting warm but we know that people also cut on the electricity price the electricity bill um, for example in trying to not using the washing machine as an invisible energy poverty and washing that the the clothes as we we have been done like uh, 100 years ago, maybe, and and that's not so possible in in our in our society. So we are trying to introduce all these needs of households to define uh, a a baseline at least. And on the other hand, I agree with you with the 10 percent indicators. And for me, it it made sense when Brenda introduced that uh, 30 years ago. But now, of course, we cannot use it for every country because it was in a situation of the UK on 1990. It makes sense in that situation. And now we have to, to focus on our situation now and what are the needs of people actually, not what is the, the median share. So we have to forget a little bit about statistics and focus on, on people needs. Which is a good point then. How do you make sure it's actually a bottom-up assessment of needs and not just an assumption of what you think people need, like you know how many hours of lighting? How are you making sure that your calculation of energy needs is based on not what you and your team think? Um, have you kind of done a wide sampling of, of different household types? Yeah, we, we also we don't we apply that for the household budget survey, but also we we are uh, working with the NGOs, so they, they are helping us to, for example, to actually validate our models. So when when we, for example, we do the electricity models, after doing that, we we validate that, comparing that with the actual uh, needs of the households and with electricity expenditure from their bills. And trying to see if we are, for example, over over um, assuming the, the needs or under uh, under assuming if it's in, and this is for now it was basic on statistics actually, and for example, time you survey st statistics by 2011, so it's a very old statistics. But now we want to to improve that using a new uh, a new statistics on electricity needs that is. 
is carrying is carrying out now from from a national entity, and so we are trying to don't forget um, about statistics at all, but but introducing also the the experience of each household. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Roberto and Harry, for this. Uh... Discussion is quite interesting, but now we are going to start with the. Um, start with me. Is that being shared now? Yeah. Yes. Can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. Okay, so this is our um, workshop presentation. It's working on uh, invisible energy for kerosene. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, firstly, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Cam. I'm from um, Birmingham originally, but I study at the University of Liverpool. I am at the Geographic Data Science Lab, and I, pre I just graduated from BA Geography. Um, so I specifically look at spatial variability in fuel poverty. And my project partner for my PhD is uh, Eon, and it works to understand the efficiency um, of housing stock and how to reduce carbon emissions to meet 2050 objectives. Um, uh, yes. uh, oh, Flavia, uh, go ahead. No, go, go first. Please. Okay, okay. Um, hi, I'm Minto Nguyen. Um, I'm a um, PhD student in psychology at University uh, Institute of Lisbon. Um, so my PhD project engaged with uh, the energy citizenship uh, concept, which is the what are the rights and responsibilities that um, citizens perceive in the context of um, um, energy transition to decentralized um, uh, energy system, for example, like positive energy district. Uh, my background is in international development, so kind of um, social science and humanities focus, and I'm started to bring my um, uh, knowledge as well as understanding about the social science uh, and humanities um, disciplines into this discussion. So, um, <laughs> I am Flavia de Carvalho. I'm about to finish my, my master's degree in renewable energy engineering at NOVA, University of Lisbon. Uh, and then my research it's still in progress. Um, it's about to, to bring um, energy independence to the invisible vulnerable from favelas in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. It is a partnership with um, one NGO that actually locally. So I'm mapping the, I'm doing a map photo, mapping photovoltaic plan for cooperative. Hello, everybody. I'm Roberto Barrella from the Chair of Energy and Poverty and Research Assistant. And apart from the topics that I presented earlier, we are also studying the feasibility and the impact of energy retrofitting measures on vulnerable households and also working on changing the regulation. So we present here the problem and the question that we are, we are studying, we're discussing. So um, maybe maybe we should put bigger the the screen that we can read better. Can um, we, yeah, we can I'll try and I'm not sure how you you do. Try this. with percent like on the top right. But yeah, the concept. Yeah, the invisible energy required a sole definition. So who are they? And so we define it a group, define it like energy vulnerable that they are that are marginalized or unrecognized by the current energy poverty policies, who's being blocked from applying for the social benefit. We have some example here. It, the like the informal residents, like the favela like, that you can see in the pictures lands, uh, precarious workers, undocumented immigrants, uh, Roma community, and other, other ones. Uh, so the question that we're gonna answer, it's gonna be what needs to be done? What are the barriers to achieve that needs to be done? 
and how should be involved in the solution. Um, so uh, here we're gonna answer the first one, what's needed from policy and our research practice. So um, this methodology we take from, from the paper. Uh, the first one is to consider opportunity for joining up and integrate policies. It's a holistic approach and different policies integrate into national strategy. So here it's like, it's to see the problem and solution broadly, like um, how, how policy uh, can com uh, combat the energy part an opportunity to tackle other problems. So when we are dealing with energy poverty, we are dealing with healthcare, uh, mental health care, or education, so social inequality, gender inequality. So it's just an opportunity to, to handle other problems too. The second one, it's the building momentum through network and partnership. So it's third part entities to mediate different sectors, the government department, and multi-level entity, EU, A, and national and local. So here we can, I can say here, more or less like to trade information from different parties to bring uh, more information to identify, mitigate them, and follow up the, the progress. Uh, the third one, it's expecting the unexpected. So it's exploring under research, under represent aspect of energy vulnerability through innovative research methodology and flexible and hectic forms of governance. So what it means, it's um, as we, uh, we was discussing, it's a multidisciplinary subject. So the policy makers and the professional in the field must be um, attend, aware, for all social problems that will come with the consequence and know how to deal and report giving like like feedbacks. So I mean, you, you can go. Yeah, yeah. so um, the fourth um, dimension in policy and research that need to be uh, done is measuring progress a more in a more holistic way. Uh, uh, almost holistically, um, which means that capture the multifaceted nature of the hidden energy precarity that we have been discussing, that is not only a problem about uh, economics or expenditure, but also um, uh, the mental health and, uh, and, and employment as well, and linking it with the causes and the consequences it may have. Um, uh, so by measuring it, it means that including both um, quantitative and qualitative indicators like um, what we have uh, exploring before in the leaf experience approach. And, um, and finally, is just get on with it. Would mean that uh, despite a lot of um, clash between different levels of policies and governance, there are, um, if uh, the local, um, uh, we, we need a stronger, connect and emphasize on the local context and how uh, energy poverty um, leave experience have been, um, have been um, um, uh, uh, explored by developing um, ideas through reflexive practice and removing power from dominant actors, especially in the uh, local level or more participatory um, um, governance mode that uh, when when we engage with uh, with energy vulnerable um, groups, um, uh, it's it's really important to keep in mind that um, uh, this is not people that are, are passive and um, and need to be uh, intervened, uh, but bringing them to the discussion and have a more reflexive about uh, what what uh, what they experience through life and whether. Um, uh, what they think is, a, is the best way to tackling the problem. Uh, and uh, by doing that, uh, it will bring a deep change in the political, economic, and social arena from the local level, even when it is challenging the very dominant discourse and dominant approach of economic growth and economic um, uh, business growth and economic development from the national level, uh, if it is clashed with the, with the lived experience of the, of the, of the vulnerables, it, it should be, um, the local level should tackle it right away. So 
Um, let's move on to what are the barriers that might hinder this, um, uh, this action. So uh, we, based on some the, the literature as well as um, my uh, the, the previous work that I and other colleagues in my consortium of smart beasts have done about the silo thinking, uh, which is the barriers mostly for uh, coordinating and integrating these, these different uh, multidisciplinary approach. So um, we define that there are three levels of barriers. Firstly, is a systematic uh, structural barriers, which means that more of a lack of resource and financing from the government to integrate policies and coordination bodies uh, across discipline and sectors. And also there's a lack of data and mismatch in reading and, represent, and presenting qualitative and quant quantitative data uh, uh, to define the problems and define where is the hidden energy precarity. And also it, stem from a very traditional uh, differences between technical and social aspects that, uh, that might hinder their communication and language barriers to bring different disciplines together. And also uh, there, is, there is structural and systematic uh, stigmatization and misrepresentation of vulnerable groups, for example, like the Roma people that are stigmatized uh, through century of, of, um, of misrepresentation. And this is a systematic barriers that is really hard and difficult to break through, um, to break um, while doing this um, coordinating um, action. Uh, at the operational level, there are bureaucracy in process of recognizing energy vulnerable, uh, vulnerables. For example, there are legal uh, lack of legal status of citizens uh, who are marginalized by the policy. Uh, there are lack of flexibility and understanding of law reinforcement, especially in the government offices. There are lack of knowledge and experience uh, about interdisciplinary integration among experts and officers as well. And especially uh, a lot of um, effort have been put in place to engage with vulnerable groups, for example, like inviting to um, participate in discussion, but there are difficulties for these vulnerable groups, especially because they are in a very, very precarity, uh, precarious situation. It's really hard to ask um, for vulnerables uh, to, to take more action and participate actively in this discussion. So, more uh, needs uh, have to be um, uh, reaching out from the from the uh, from the coordinating bodies to reach these uh, vulnerable groups, and um, there are motivational barriers as well, which is more um, uh, about uh, whether the, polit uh, the the politicians and um, political actors have the will to build a network and partnership. Um, and in some cases, there are conflict of interest between the political parties and the government at different levels. For example, local level want to tackle in these social problems, but uh, they clash with the with the national level of policy. So, um, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Cam, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so our last question was who's, who's, um, who should be involved and who is usually involved in the solution. Um, fuel poverty is a very complex uh, issue that requires a variety of different stakeholders to firstly get a better understanding and uh, also implement a correct strategy. Uh, however, uh, it seems to be quite limited in who's involved. Um, so firstly, who's usually involved is local council and governments. So looking at the UK situation, the government have quite a lot of schemes to make the, we the winter months especially more easier for vulnerable individuals, so just the cold weather payments. Um, next is academia. Um, as you know, we're, we're, in, we're in this workshop now. Um, researchers all over the world are, are researching the extent of fuel poverty, the variability, uh, the drivers, and which policy should be implemented using a variety of different methods and data sets. Um, NGOs and charities. Um, in the UK, we have the uh, National Energy Action, which works to ensure that everyone in the UK can have access to a warm home, and if not, um, why and what needs to be done about it. Um, however, we also identified groups who we feel should be involved. Um, so firstly, uh, household welfare. So we need to ensure that house, uh, social housing is fit for living. So having certain EPC certificate uh, ratings and certificates. Um, next, education is vital. Um, we need to educate individuals on fuel poverty and make sure people understand what support is available and how to get it. 
Um, next is healthcare system. Um, we know fuel poverty causes enhanced more mortality both in the summer and winter months. Um, so we need to understand the, how it does this and also looking at the mental health problems. Healthcare professionals should be involved to explore the, to explore the consequences of those living in fuel poverty. Um, social housing, um, you need to have the landlord's name printed on the contract so they can easily access the landlord, uh, communicate with them and also push them to retrofit the households rather, so we can combat the causes of fuel poverty rather than the consequences. Um, energy, um, energy provider is a vital one as well. Um, they'll get a host of problems reported to them from vulnerable households and from this you can understand the main problems reported from individuals so we can enable them to be you know, sold first. And then a consumer union uh, federation to protect vulnerable customers. In the UK, we have Ofgem to regulate the big six companies. Um, they try to ensure lower bills, environmental protection, enhanced reliability, and overall better customer service and social outcomes. And lastly, uh, we feel that uh, cooperatives and energy communities should be involved. So cooperatives are people center enterprises run and controlled by their members to realize the common interest. So we can understand vulnerable groups' main concerns and concentrate funds to what to focus on. Um, and this concludes to this. So as conclusion, we can suggest that everybody from the policymakers to the energy companies should consider energy as a necessity and also a universal right within an commodity. So trade people as as people, not as customers. And also the, the citizen engagement in claiming the rights for equality, both in energy accessibility, but also in energy affordability. So it should be something that uh, very important for to try to fix and, and try to solve this problem. Also, we have to think the how to make these people, these lives visible, how to, for example, talk about Cañada Real, so the people who are living in Cañada Real can be visible for the public opinion, but also for the political uh, parties. Um, but before doing all the intervention, we have to understand the daily life of these people. So, um, and whatever they cook or not cook, if they, if they cannot use a washing machine because they, they're afraid of the energy bill. And understanding that we can, after that, intervene and, and implement uh, accurate uh, measures. So another big problem also uh, after the housing problem is the quality of the housing. So um, the housing energy cost depends mostly on the quality of the housing apart from the climate. So we have to improve that. And also to summarize all of that, we need an integrated policy framework, but also we need to build a momentum for networks and partnership to, to try to solve and try to, to, to help the vulnerable houses to get out of energy poverty. Thank you very much for, for your attention. And if you have any question, we are here uh, open to, to answer you. Thank you, Roberto, uh, Min, Cameron, Flavia. That's great. Um, wondering if um, this presentation prompts any reaction from anyone here, any questions? Um, in relation to what we've been discussing today, but also uh, uh, throughout the whole week. Yes, uh, Miguel. Uh, hello, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering about uh, housing conditions that you spoke of because in a, in some cases of uh, energy poverty the housing conditions itself they are uh, it goes beyond that so 
also in the, the example I think Sergio gave us of the smaller community near Madrid. In that case, it's um, even if they have the energy, all the energy that they wanted, there, there are still problems in the housing condition, in the salubrity of the, the house. And uh, I wonder how can we look at these uh, informal uh, settlements or uh, degraded uh, neighborhoods and uh, act not only on energy poverty, but also on really improving the, the household conditions, the, the salubrity, the, the, the full, uh, full urban uh, regeneration, renovation in these neighborhoods. Thank you very much, Miguel, for, for the question. And it's a very interesting question. And the fact that, for example, in the, the Cañada Real, you know, of course, first of all, it's a housing problem because they, they don't have a house. They're not living in a house. Most of them are living in slums or they, they try to build a kind of house, but it is not as well, it's not as good as um, whatever uh, dwelling in, in Madrid. And that is the, so it's the first problem is the lack of a housing um, framework to solve, first of all, the problem of housing. So they can go uh, and live in a, with dignity in, in a house. And uh, on the other hand, in the Cañada Real, there are a lot of problems. Um, maybe sometimes we focus on energy poverty because of our uh, our will is to solve energy poverty, but there are political problems also. Not only the energy companies has the the, the fault, but I think the government administration, or especially the regional, has to to make a choice and and really help these people, and not to just try to push these people to go out from that neighborhood because it's actually their home. So you are, you are, and some of them, when you propose them to go to farther, far, far away from there, they're not gonna say yes. Because if someone tell me, ask me if you want, see if I want to go to, to the countryside now, I will say not. Why? And, and this is my home. And so we have to think about and I think this is very important to, to talk with this, these people. We, we talk, especially with the association of neighbor uh, of Caña Real and in understanding each of these households, each of these persons uh, have a problem and is, is goal beyond energy poverty actually. If I may, sorry, Lynn, you were going to say something. Uh, no, I just uh, want to agree and emphasize that these problems are interconnected between energy poverty, social housing, housing policy, uh, poverty, and um, sorry, <laughs> and uh, yeah, transport. Um, they are all. Um, if we approach a problem in a more holistic way and have a more systematic um, approach. Um, then we can connect the problem of uh, energy poverty from the gentrification that Roberto is, uh, is describing. Um, and uh, so that when, whenever we design, uh, when, when design any in, um, technology or intervention for um, energy poverty, we, take, we also take into account this um, uh, problematic issue of housing and gentrification. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Min, Roberto. Any other comments, reflections? We are, we are really clear, we there. they are very tired after one week <laughs> of training and working. <laughs> I'm seeing here what Harry just posted on, on the chat box. So it's um, um, bringing up this um, example of South Africa. Uh, I don't know, perhaps Harry, you want to tell us a bit more about that? Sure, yeah. I think um, 
there's a few really interesting researchers in South Africa writing on issues of um, kind of historic lack of access to electrification and the ways in which um, that's kind of been granted, but then um, the kind of additional problems that's brought about. Uh, there's, a, there's a book chapter that I can link to later on. Perhaps I'll pass it to Sid to, to distribute. Um, but I think, you know, this isn't a new problem if we look outside of Europe. It's perhaps just that Europe's having to confront these issues. Um, and I think in turn, that's really just systemic issues of racism and classism. And that's <laughs> not something that's easy to dismantle overnight. Um, yeah, I think, but as Min was saying, you know, it, it, we, we have to consider that holistically uh, and intersectionally. Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, um, oh, sorry, Pedro, you wanted to and see. No, I, I was just thinking that um, in this informal uh, settlements, for instance, in Portugal, most uh, they are mostly occupied by by ethnic minorities, and we we talk about the need for policy to address this issue and and f to have policy, we need data, but just even just the data collection part um, is controversial. Because, for instance, now with census in Portugal, there was a big controversy controversy about asking people what what is their ethnicity. So this is there's even in the data collection there's 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 maybe um, some some divided opinions about if we should collect if we should ask people for for their ethnicity or their religion or their. So it's it's hard to 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 design policies where when when we are having problems even just collecting the data. I'm just going to say that. Yeah, we've seen that. I mean, uh, with Raul, um, Raul's team at um, um, uh, the Universidad Carlos III, um, the leading small research on Cañada Real and access, I mean, we, We've done two data collection days and through field work and there, and it's been, yeah, it is, it is challenging. Um, yeah. Seed. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I was just um, thinking it might be useful to reflect back on how this, um, how like intersecting inequalities and ways of exclusion tied to, you know, um, ethnicity, race, but, and gender, but certainly also um, things like income in some contexts, cost, um, uh, are also to some extent dependent on what what social technical system we're talking of. And I can speak uh, from looking at solar energy in multiple quite different contexts. I'm running a project now. We're looking at Portugal and India together, and at, at solar at multiple scales. And uh, and I think what what is important to consider there is that the nature of the particular technologies and then the, the kind of schemes and affirmative action um, linked with that is really dependent on the social material nature of it is you know it, it's not any one thing solar can be so many things and uh, if it's a large thing or a small thing if the legislative regimes in place allow for things like community energy if they allow for things like uh, virtual um, net metering if they allow for remuneration um, all of that uh, kind of goes goes hand in hand with considerations of where do we push to address, um, like to use the benefits, the possible benefits um, for energy poverty alleviation in a way that can be inclusive, that can be equitable across these uh, um, lines of uh, of inequality, but also um, to safeguard against it being. Um, against exacerbating inequalities. And just to go momentarily back to the, the first module in the Norway example, when you see these systems getting like a lot of sectoral coupling um, of, uh, you know, the electricity sector in the household getting increasingly linked up with electrified transport, you have the, the potential of actually working against the people with much more inflexible needs who are often armed, the energy poor, um, while other people can use the fact that they have car batteries that are increasingly becoming two-way feeds to the grid. Um, so it's not only in contexts that are, let's say, relatively, that have relatively deprived populations that can be hidden in ways that we don't necessarily see, that we can anticipate for the kinds of changes happening now, especially with 
low carbon infrastructure, which are led by these very glossy, shiny kind of imaginaries of the future that can be quite misleading in terms of where extraction happens and the kind of hidden burdening really um, that we're talking about in this module. Yeah, thanks, links to uh, energy transitions and energy justice there. Um, okay, so um, I mean, it's 20 to one, a place in Central European time. I suggest that uh, we do the, the closing statement uh, that Raul and I have prepared. And perhaps we can, um, uh, we can um, open up the, the floor again for a few minutes for anyone to, to say anything, uh, to share anything about the, the training school and perhaps to see it uh, or and others from Engager to, to do any sort of closing words. Do you want to go, Raul? Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Well, so um, uh, to conclude, no, the on my final comment uh, for today uh, is more uh, what uh, what we can do as researchers, not to contribute to this this issue, not this societal uh, 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 problem, no. So I uh, thinking now maybe uh, for sure no uh, different thing no I'm going to to pointing out now we have been talking uh, through all the week and and in the presentation before and um, uh, but I have uh, um, identified no three different areas in terms of data funding and awareness uh, regarding. Regarding data, uh, what I mean here is uh, that we need to, to detect, we need to use uh, data source uh, that are currently not present no, in, in energy poverty indicator framework. Uh, use this data, no, uh, identify this, uh, this specific data, uh, which allows us to uh, recognize and may visible uh, hidden uh, form of energy poverty uh, um, uh, these uh, social issues that we can't uh, uh, identify, we can't recognize with current uh, statistical data. Uh, also, uh, we need to uh, use contextualized uh, data uh, when advocating uh, uh, policy design uh, in terms that uh, each specific case study is different and we need to uh, properly understand no, what is the issue, what is the problem there, no? as we all have been commenting uh, uh, today. Then in terms of funding, uh, here the, uh, my comment is regarding that we need to also take time to promote proposal uh, that uh, mobilize uh, funding uh, for unrecognized form of energy poverty. And some example can be uh, several projects working on uh, currently, such as the Energy Poverty Intelligence Unit here in Getafe. In this project, we aim to identify hidden energy poverty in, in, in Getafe. And with hidden energy poverty, we uh, mean these uh, uh, no, this people no, uh, uh, who are not currently identified uh, by the, the energy uh, social services you know, in, 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 in Getafe. Uh, but also the, the, the project uh, has uh, previously commented Sergio in La Cañada. Uh, we, there we aim to, to characterize, characterize you know, the energy uses and needs of uh, the population in, in La Cañada Real. And the last one is, is, the, is a, new, a new project I'm, I'm collaborating with uh, Sophie Persmark, Harry Thompson, and Carla Ricardé in, in Finland. This is the Finnish Energy Observatory. And you have available our first uh, policy brief. And this is not also one of the line of action, no? One of the activities to, to give a, a voice no? to uh, those uh, uh, vulnerable people there in Finland no? that are experiencing energy poverty. In terms of awareness, uh, here there can, I would like to uh, emphasize two different aspects. The first one is that uh, as researchers, we need to be aware that uh, 
um, certain uh, lived experiences and social group are not even present in, in data source. Uh, this uh, traditional uh, source that we have been using not to identify energy poverty, and we need to, to, to focus on that. And then we need to understand uh, who we are working with and what uh, the uh, main problem are, uh, because uh, those uh, people are people that they are struggling uh, with the day-to-day -day activity. So the main problem may not be that they are living in a uh, poor quality energy efficiency house, uh, but that they can eat or they can uh, have the, uh, uh, the the legal uh, paper, no, the, the right to live uh, in, in a country, no. So we need to to properly understand, no, uh, and empathize with them. But the other aspect, uh, the other idea, is that we need to to keep the issue of energy poverty present in, in society, no, and make visible, no, this this issue, no, and uh, disseminating results, developing policy brief, call for action. So this is something that we need to uh, to keep in mind. Also uh, support uh, the different association working in, in, in this uh, topic, engage with, in their activity, spread the word. So help them no, uh, in, in their day-to-day uh, -day activities. Um, uh, the last one could be uh, and ideally you know, to create local, regional, even national networks, uh, gathering citizen, uh, welfare organization, policy maker, uh, and private sector. No? This kind of activity that uh, is quite well doing no? in the work, uh, work group three in Engage, um, uh, this is not quite, quite relevant uh, and useful. No? So this is uh, my, my main comment no? of today's session, the three, these three aspects. Um, and that's all. Uh, now I'm going to hand over Sergio uh, to uh, have uh, uh, their last uh, comment and so. Thanks, Raul. Okay, very briefly. Um, so I'm uh, picking up here on what uh, something that Harriet said on day two, which I really like the, um, these two ideas of um, energy for the indicators being completely and complex. So um, I think as a final statement saying that uh, we need to be uh, aware of how indicators shape our understanding of what energy poverty is. Um, I mean, we as researchers and we as society, so they, 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 they have an impact on how uh, people think and uh, imagine energy poverty. Despite being um, a simply uh, uh, numerical representation of a limited range of forms and experience of energy poverty and uh, something missing very often those at the very bottom. So the, um, the underlying issue here may be how do we know about energy poverty and who gets to decide what constitutes energy poverty. I think the, the most clear example for me is prepayment meters. I, I interviewed um, a, a government officials in Hungary um, a, who were stating that uh, someone on a prepayment meter was um, lifted out of uh, fuel poverty, of energy poverty, whereas in my understanding prepayment meters are just a way of uh, reproducing and, and, and making someone um, be stuck in an insecure access to, to energy supply kind of situation. So the, it is political. The, and there is dissensus and controversies on, on what gets recognized as energy poverty. On the other hand, there, there, are, there are ways to which um, we can get to a more consensual or a broader understanding through participatory approach of what energy poverty is and how it gets measured and represented um, uh, quantitatively. And then the theory of statistics. Sorry. Um, on the one hand, um, we can think what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. I mean, perhaps it's an overstatement, but the truth, but it is to some extent, it is true that in, in our societies, 
data driven, driven decision making is uh, increasingly important and that means that whatever is not quantified um maybe may end up ignored in policy processes and i think that's um, that that's something we need to bear in mind and then um precisely what we were the 0 0.5 percent of the population who is um, uh, experiencing some forms of uh, invisible or hidden forms of energy poverty. What happens when, when the numbers are very low on, on data are not available at all? And um, I my um, take here is that um, these, there is experiences of deep energy poverty that are being, um, despite current energy poverty indicators being extremely useful for the recognition and the monitoring of anything that has to do with energy poverty, they they tend to discriminate uh, these um, um, deeper forms of energy poverty, such as that or these connections, uh, which I think that's also that needs to be highlighted. Um, okay, that's all from me. Thanks, um, thanks so much for for being with us today and the whole week. I think it's been. I think it's been a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, if anyone want to to give and uh, say some last word, or otherwise, uh, we would like to to uh, give no the the last minute to sit to uh, to wrap up. Thanks. Um, shall, shall we stop the recording perhaps? <laughs>